This is Midweek Bible Study with Pastor Alan Deuce. Good evening, or oh, welcome back to Midweek Bible Study. Uh, take your Bibles with me if you would like, and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. There was a guy, his name was Uncle Buddy Robinson. His, his name was Bud Robinson, but he became known in the Church of the Nazarene as Uncle Buddy. He uh, was an early Nazarene evangelist, late 1800s, early 1900s. But before he became a Christian, he was actually a, uh, a cowboy in Texas. He had a speech impediment, um, and he had this beautiful story. He came to Jesus at a tent meeting, a camp meeting, and uh, Jesus really got a hold of him, and he wanted all of his friends to know Jesus as well. Well, I mean, he, he knew nothing about what it meant to be a Christian, and he'd come to this camp meeting and gotten saved, and he wanted his cowboy friends to come to Jesus, so what'd he do? He went and he talked to them, and they're like, there's no way we're going to this meeting with you about Jesus, and finally, in frustration, he just pulled a gun, and he marched them all to camp meeting at gunpoint, and he took them, and he walked them all the way down. He made them kneel at the altar and told them they were going to come to know Jesus. I'm not sure exactly how well that worked out for them at that point, uh, but but even with a very limited education, he had a speech impediment. Uh, this guy became an incredibly effective communicator of the gospel and evangelist for Jesus. He shared his story, and he shared the story of Jesus. Tonight here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, what I really notice is that Paul is emphasizing that each one of us needs to learn to practice what we preach. And he begins by saying, share the story of Jesus. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, where it says, And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, <clears throat> when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. Now, Paul was talking to the Corinthians, and remember that the Corinthians were in uh, the city of Corinth, a large city in the Greek Roman Empire. It was Greece, uh, and it had been taken over uh, by the Romans. So it was Greek culture, it was Greek people, and the Greeks were masters of public speaking. They loved great speeches. They loved great speech makers. You know, when you were a Greek parent uh, and you were dreaming about what your children would become in their lives, one of the great dreams for every parent is for their child to become a famous orator in the Greco-Roman tradition. Uh, so this was really important to the Greeks. Paul was a Jew, and he was extremely intelligent, he was extremely articulate, he was highly educated, but notice what Paul says. He says, I didn't come to you with flowery philosophical speeches or a lot of human wisdom. He told them the basic gospel story. He told them the story of Jesus. Now, he was capable of incredible speech making, and you see that in his letters at times. But he came to them, he emphasizes to these folks who we know from chapter 1 were really, really struggling to stay focused on Jesus and not to, to move off into the rabbit trails and uh, the diverted uh, attention to, uh, to, to many things related to rhetoric, speech, human wisdom. That was the real challenge that they were facing was the contrast between human wisdom and God's wisdom. And he said, I didn't come to you with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaim to you the testimony about God. Paul practiced what he was challenging them and us to practice. Uh, Paul wasn't opposed to using your brain. He was opposed to allowing human wisdom to get in the way of our focus on God's wisdom. Instead, he said, focus on the cross. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. 
Now that's fascinating to me because the Apostle Paul was obviously a very articulate spokesperson for the gospel and he through his letters goes into so much detail about all the dimensions of what God wants to do in our lives and in our world and he's a master of theology and the intricacies of theology and philosophy and and all of the the knowledge of that particular time period of the world and yet he says I resolved to know to focus on, to communicate, to live into nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Paul reminds me there is no one like Jesus. Jesus is God in flesh who was crucified for us. And now you can look at, 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 all you have to do is Google it on your phone or on your other device right now. You can look at the main main teachings of every religion all over the world right now and I you know I've been studying them for a long time now you can look at the teachings and there are a lot of good things that all of them say there are many things that we can learn from every religion all around the world but there is nothing there is no one I am a Christian by birth and by choice there is no one like Jesus there is no other religious leader who was crucified for my sin. Jesus accepted the cross because of me, because of us. It's a simple message. We sinned. Jesus came and died. We received his grace. Jesus atoned for us. This message drives me to go deeper with Jesus. Each one of us is invited, challenged, called to go deeper with Jesus. But going deeper with Jesus isn't just about my, my, my intellect or my knowledge. It involves that. But it's not about human wisdom. It's about recognizing. It's about knowing Jesus, appreciating what he's done for me, and getting prepared to tell other people about Jesus. Like Paul. We don't have to be ready to talk about all of the different profound aspects of our faith in order to tell someone about Jesus. We, we can just tell them about Jesus. Some of the best evangelists I've ever known have been people who were very, very simple people who, who didn't understand all the profound dimensions of the faith, but they knew Jesus. And they shared the love of Jesus with friends and family members and they pointed them to Jesus in a life-changing way. When my strength and my wisdom are devoted to Jesus, he takes whatever gifts and talents and abilities, the strengths, and, and, and makes them stronger. Jesus wants to take you and help you to see again to know Christ and Him crucified, to focus on Him on the cross. See, Paul reminds me that he came here to Corinth when he was at, at one of his most weak and vulnerable times. Look at verse 3. I came to you in weakness and with great fear and trembling. Now, what's going on? Well, if you look over in the book of Acts, Acts gives the sequential story of much of the Apostle Paul's travels and his ministry, and it tells us in Acts chapter 17 that Paul was in Athens before he went to Corinth. And we've discussed before the fact that Paul preached on Mars Hill at the center of Greek wisdom and philosophical training. Mars Hill was a, a, a big rock at the foot of, of the, the great hill, which was the center of Greek wisdom and knowledge and learning. We did the Parthenon, and you had all of these temples devoted to the, the great gods that the Greeks and the Romans worshipped, and it was the center of their, their culture and their wisdom and their discussion. Athens, this great city, was the center for, for the philosophical Greeks. And when Paul was there, Acts 17 tells us that Athens was the only place in all of Paul's recorded travels that he didn't establish a church. He went, he ministered, he talked, but he didn't establish a church. And from there he went to Corinth. And, and so when he got to Corinth, he had just experienced what many believe was his greatest apostolic disappointment. 
He, he didn't establish a church in Athens. He did everywhere else. So he was greatly disappointed. He came to them weak and frustrated and fearful and trembling, he says. Maybe he's thinking, you know, I, I've gone to this major Greek city and maybe after all, I don't have what it takes to tell Greek people about Jesus. Maybe Jesus isn't going to help me to reach Greek people. Maybe Paul is thinking he just isn't good enough. We don't know exactly. He didn't go into that much detail, but, but we hear him saying strongly, I came to you in weakness, in great fear, and with trembling. So what really amazes and challenges me and impresses me is that Paul, while he's feeling incredibly vulnerable and at his lowest, he says he's weak and terrified, and he got back on that horse and he shared Jesus with the Corinthians. He just kept sharing Jesus at his most vulnerable. And look what happened. Jesus blessed his efforts. He established a tremendous church in Corinth, even though they had great problems and the issues that he's dealing with here in these letters, they est he established a great church there. He came weak and vulnerable, but he recognized that he depended on God's power and God's wisdom. Look at verse 4. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. This literally says, with a demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Paul emphasizes he isn't focused on his own wise words, his own wisdom, his own persuasive speech. He's showing them God's wisdom and he is living in, compelled by, and empowered by, not his own strength, but God's power. God's spirit worked in them by God's power. The Corinthians were apparently caught up with a desire to have this showy um, wisdom and, and showy spiritual gifts. And we'll get into that later on when we look at chapters 12 through 14. But Paul kept showing them that it is all about Jesus. The simple gospel message is Jesus Christ and him crucified. Sometimes it just seems too simple. I, I was reminded yesterday, I, I shared Jesus with someone yesterday. What an incredible opportunity to have, have this conversation with this person. And I kept having to remind myself multiple times to stay focused on the simple gospel message. The simple message about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It was enough. It was enough. I kept wanting to run down all these interesting and exciting rabbit trails. Jesus said, stay focused on Jesus. It was enough. She was persuaded that Jesus is who he says he is, and she gave her heart to Jesus right there. I was tempted to have all these other things. They weren't bad things, but they would have distracted from the straightforward message about Jesus. You know, we need to remember that we're utterly dependent on God's wisdom and God's power. If there was ever a time in the history of humankind that we needed God's wisdom and power, it's today. We are facing some tremendous strongholds in our culture, some, some deeply entrenched ideas that are becoming more firmly embedded in our culture that are absolutely in opposition to Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Jesus said, love God with absolutely everything about you. Love Him with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And when I do this, I'm being like Jesus. He said, love other people as much as you love yourself. That's the simple gospel message. Know, love, and serve Jesus. Follow Jesus. Take up your cross and follow Jesus. He gave this message of sacrificial love as the heart of his message. Simple, straightforward, absolutely true. And then when, when he, he illustrated it, he modeled it by going to the cross for us. You know, at its foundation, the gospel of Jesus isn't incredibly complex. Now, the expanded version is pretty complicated because it addresses all of our concerns, all of our questions, everything that we face in our very complicated lives and complicated world. But at the core of our faith is Jesus. And Jesus comes to us and makes himself so reachable 
so understandable. And he reminds us here that salvation is by grace through faith. Look at verse 5. So that your faith, now remember, my message and my preaching were not about wise or with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. Salvation, our faith, rests on God. His power, not our own, but His. Later in his letter to the Ephesians, Paul wrote, It is by grace you have been saved through faith. You know, our faith isn't built on our wisdom. Our faith isn't built on what we do. It's not built on what we think. It's not built on what we say. We are saved by God's grace. His power saves us, sanctifies us, and keeps us. God's love and wisdom sent His Son to be our Savior. That's the truth. God's wisdom is what said, people can't redeem themselves. They need a Savior. My love is so great that I'm sending them my Son to be their Savior. That is the wisdom and the power of God. We have enormous knowledge and wisdom today, and I'm so grateful. Isn't it fun to live in a time when we have electricity and we can travel by airplanes to see those we care about and to go to new places? Isn't it great that we have computers that can do almost anything? But people have come to rely on the wisdom of science for almost everything. And we can learn so much, but we cannot rely on human wisdom to save us from our sin. In the middle of all of the knowledge that we have all around us, everything that we know, the human condition remains unchanged. People still are motivated by anger and hatred and discord and strife and struggle to have healthy, positive relationships, whether it's in families or among friends or even nationally and internationally. We need God's power and God's wisdom to change human hearts and human lives. So, Paul says, embrace God's wisdom. Verse 6, we do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. Generally, the Jews of Paul's era divided time between the present age, which is dominated by sin and sinful people, and the future age, which will be fully and completely redeemed. The rulers of this age probably refers to principalities and powers, all of the dark spiritual forces. The wisdom of this age is being continually impacted, influenced, even corrupted by spiritual darkness. And all of that will ultimately come to nothing. The enemy is destined for the lake of fire. All of the world's wisdom will be shown to be inadequate. The only thing that will last is Jesus and his wisdom. See, God's wisdom shows us the path to salvation. When I come to Jesus, my life here starts getting freed from sin and all of the sinful entanglements that are damaging. And the ideas and attitudes that damage my relationships are redeemed as I come to follow Jesus more and more fully. And the things that I did under the influence of sin start to change as Jesus unravels those things and gets me fully focused on the cross. So addictions are conquered and anger and fear and jealousy and pride stop having such an impact on my attitudes and my relationships and everything about my life. God's wisdom says, love your neighbor. Don't be afraid. Don't be angry. Try to understand as well as trying to be understood. See, God's mystery for salvation is made plain in Jesus. Verse 7. No, we declare God's wisdom a mystery that's been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. See, until Jesus came, people really didn't understand who the Messiah was going to be. Uh, Jews had some ideas because there were a lot of prophecies about the coming Messiah, but, but they, they had decided that they believed that the Messiah needed to come and overthrow the enemies of Israel and immediately set up a world government in Jerusalem. And this is Christmas. Jesus came, and he was born to a poor virgin in a barn instead of in a palace. 
Jesus lived in obscurity for 30 years until the time of his ministry. And his three-year ministry, it changed the world. His death and resurrection accomplished God's work of redemption. Now, there are so many clues about that in the Old Testament, about what Jesus would do when he came the first time and what he's going to do when he comes the second time. But it was a mystery until he actually came. It wasn't exactly what they expected. That's the nature of mystery. Now, for our glory is an interesting phrase. You don't hear Paul or anyone else in the Bible talking about human glory positively very often because we are focused on God's glory, not our own. The glory the angels sing about in Luke 2 belongs to God, not to us. Some think here this, this glory that he's talking about is the glory that we will experience at glorification when we pass from this life into the presence of Jesus in eternity, and I think that's part of it. But it can also be the amazing glory because our salvation starts today. The moment I come to be redeemed, my eternity with Jesus starts now. It doesn't wait for glorification. It's just finished when I move into eternity with Jesus there. That glory of our salvation is God's creation. It's God sharing his glory with us. We're going to be glorified, but we are glorious saved gloriously saved by Jesus today. This is Christmas. Jesus came in incredibly humble circumstances. His birth was shrouded in mystery. God had given clues for a couple of thousand plus years. We need to be reminded to practice what we preach by listening to the simple gospel story. We need to share that simple love story with everyone all around us. I need to remember what I preach, what I believe, what I live, to look for the baby in the manger and the man on the cross. He is the power of God for my salvation this Christmas. Thank the Lord he is. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much today for your grace and your love for your life and your mercy. I pray your blessing this Christmas season on every man and woman and boy and girl who is touched this Christmas by the love that we have for you and by the love that we can share with our family and our friends and our neighbors. Bless us, God, to be about the business of sharing the good news of Jesus. In the strong and mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for joining me. Have a terrific week.